What is the scariest story you know that is 100% true? My dad and some friends got drunk and went for a drive on some back roads and were going as fast as the truck would go as teenagers. My dad was slightly less drunk than the others and eventually demanded they let him get out. They pulled over and he and one other girl got out. He and the girl started walking to town while the other three sped off in the opposite direction. Well less than a mile up the road from where they got out is an extremely sharp turn which they missed, and hit a tree going pretty close to triple digits, miles per hour. Two of them died on impact and the only reason the third survived, is because they crashed in front of a house, that two doctors lived in. The survivor was paralyzed, and lost his leg and part of his arm, and was in the hospital for 8 months before dying. This was in the back quote 60 years. So medical care wasn't what it is today. When I first got my permit my dad took me to that corner to explain the importance of safe driving. It gave me goosebumps about how close he was to being in the truck. He said that the dad of the driver got what remained of the truck to be hung up in the center of town for months after to be a warning to all. That's terrifying. I missed a situation like this years ago, was hanging out with a buddy at the bars and we leave to go back to his place for some smoke and video games. His roommate comes home from work, he was a bartender, and tells us he's heading out to the bars, and asks if we want to go, he'll drive, we go back and forth but eventually decide to stay in, turns out, the buddy had been drinking heavily at work, but we couldn't tell, he ended up flipping his jeep off of an overpass, and dropping 20 plus feet, the entire back of his jeep, where I would have been sitting, was crushed into the back of the front seat, the roll bar was smashed into the passenger side. Buddy ended up getting some serious brain injuries and spent the next few years learning how to walk and talk again. He's still pretty off and much different than he used to be. My other buddy and I came very close to a similar or worse fate. Told this here before but once more. My friend had this neighbor who was a retired mechanic. They lived on some properties with large front lawns and long driveways. His neighbor had a couple derelict cars parked up near his garage that he took parts from occasionally. This neighbor of his started hearing noises while sitting in his living room, coming from his front yard. Every time he'd go to the window, there would be nothing there. He assumed it was a raccoon or a coyote or whatever. He kept hearing the noise, so he'd go outside to look around, but would find nothing. He'd put out traps and occasionally catch something, yet the noise persisted. Soon. He started claiming that he was hearing voices coming from the front yard, like whispering. He'd go outside and look around the perimeter of his property, but would find nothing. It was persistent, so he'd started calling the cops. Every time the cops came and looked around and would find nothing, so they told him he needed to stop calling them for this and perhaps get a security camera or whatever. So this guy thought he was losing his mind. One summer evening he couldn't sleep. So he went to the back patio to smoke a cigarette. Suddenly, he heard voices coming from the front of his house. He put his cig out and snuck around to the front and got there just in time to see the doors to his derelict conversion van silently shut. He ran back to the backyard and went inside his home and called the police to tell them what he had seen. The police arrived and approached cold, that is, without lights slash sirens, and when they approached the van, the doors swung open and a bunch of people ran out in every direction. Upon searching the van, the cops found syringes and paraphernalia and determined that people were shooting up and there. My friend's boss bought an Audi A4 convertible. Back when they were new and interesting, one of the talking points was the pop-up roll hoops that were hidden. Unless you rolled it, a few months after buying it, he got to test those roll hoops out as he lost control and skidded down a steep bank about 10 meters. 35 feet deep the roll hoops did their job and he survived with just cuts and scratches from the bushes he plowed through the car ended up the right way up and he got out walked back up the bank to the side of the road then got on the phone to the police to report the accident while he was standing there a driver from a car that had seen the accident came over to speak to him approaching from behind the other driver asked if he was okay my friend's boss turned around to reply and dropped dead his neck had been fractured, but was in one piece right up, until he turned his head, when it severed his spinal cord. Before my dad died, he once told me a story from, when he was in Vietnam in the 1960s. 
he told me about a mission where he, and one other American with 5 CIDG strikers, South Vietnamese villagers turned fighters, were tasked to emplace seismic ground sensors along a trail network deep in the jungle. He said they were about two days into the mission, when he and two of the strikers split off from the main group, to go watch a nearby trail intersection. He said the jungle was pretty quiet that day, just the sounds of birds and bugs and an occasional monkey. He said they had been watching the trail intersection for about 3 or 4 hours, and were deciding on whether to move further down the trail, or to turn back, and link up with the rest of the patrol. Before leaving the cover of the brush my dad said he checked the trail ahead of them one last time and prepared his men to move. Now here is where the story gets interesting, and he told this part with absolute dead seriousness, he said just as he started to step out onto the trail he sees a light skinned black union cavalry soldier in full battle gear laying alongside the trail just shy of the intersection. My dad said the union soldier had two pistols, a Spencer rifle and a short curved club at his hip. As my dad was trying to process what he was seeing, the soldier looked directly at him and smiled. Then the soldier slowly placed a finger up to his lips, as if to tell him to be silent, and then motioned my dad back off the trail. My dad said he signaled for his men to remain hidden, and he recalled that as he slipped back into the jungle on one side of the trail. The Union soldier did the same on his side of the trail. Less than 10 seconds later he said the lead element of a group of NVA, North Vietnamese Army soldiers, walked right through the trail intersection some 30 feet away. My dad estimated that the group was comprised of some 70, 80 soldiers equipped with automatic rifles, light machine guns and rocket propelled grenade launchers. He has no doubt that his entire team would have been wiped out on the spot. He said as soon as the enemy soldiers had passed, he and his team beat feet out of there as fast and as quietly as they could, and rejoined with the rest of the patrol. He reported the enemy soldiers his team had encountered, but decided not to say anything about the soldier he had seen. My dad kept this secret for many many years, only telling me just before he passed, and earlier only telling his grandmother on her deathbed in the 1970s. He said when he told his grandmother, she smiled and without opening her eyes told him, you saw old Red Tom. Red Tom was my great great grandfather. He was a half black half creek free man who was a scout for the Union Army during the Civil War and later served with the US. Cavalry in the American West. He was known for carrying two pistols, a Spencer rifle and a creek war club into battle. A bunch of girls in my friend group decided to have a night out, and ended up at the local gay club. I can't remember why I didn't go, but I'm sort of glad I wasn't there. However I also wish I had been, so I cold helped. Anyway, they noticed a girl on the dance floor who looked super out of place. She had sweet pants and a t-shirt on, and wasn't wearing macup, and had her hair in a ponytail. She also had a backpack on. Basically, the exact opposite of typical club attire and not at all what someone would usually wear to this place. They said that she seemed very dazed as well, and more importantly, there was a very large man grabbing her, and grinding on her, and she was just kind of standing there letting it happen. One of my friends tried approaching her to ask if she was alright, but the guy spoke for her, and insisted that he was her boyfriend, and that she just had too much to drink but that she was okay. Everyone was suspicious, but at that point there wasn't much else they could do, so they just kept an eye on the two of them. Eventually the guy left the dance floor to go to the bar and my friend was able to talk to this girl again. She said that she was extremely out of it, and that it seemed more likely that she had been drugged rather than just drunk. The girl managed to convey that she didn't know the man she was with and wanted to leave, so my friend grabbed her and made for the exit. But not before this guy came back, he immediately flipped out, got right in my friend's face, and started screaming at her. It escalated to the point that he eventually swung at my friend who just barely dodged the punch. Thankfully, someone else had went and found a security guard and they were able to prevent this guy from hurting anyone. Meaning that my friends and the girl were all able to leave safely. She was still super messed up when they left so nobody could get the full story out of her. But she did say that the guy had been following her around town all day. The really scary part is that the bar staff couldn't technically do anything other than throw this guy out after my friends had left. One of them called the cops and gave them a description of the guy. But they said they couldn't really do much other than be on the lookout for him. So chances are that he's still out there somewhere and may do this again. 
In the late 1950s the Soviet Union spearheaded a campaign to convince the World Health Organization that smallpox could be eradicated. Smallpox is a highly contagious disease that is specific to humans. In suffer as we know, no other species on earth can get or carry smallpox. In 1977, the last case of smallpox was identified and snuffed out. The disease was eradicated. However, rather than destroy the final genetic samples of the disease, the Cold War superpowers decided to store it. Some went to the Soviet Union and some went to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. The Soviets began a weaponization program. This means that they tried to make a stronger, more contagious, more lethal strain of smallpox. They tried to cross it with other diseases like Ebola, creating entirely artificial chimera diseases. They grew smallpox in the lab by the ton, and kept it loaded, ready to be fired on missiles into the United States. But it's not a missile that's frightening. A single glass ampule of the stuff, smashed against the wall of a subway station in New York or Chicago or Tokyo could spark a global outbreak. Very, very few people alive today have been vaccinated for smallpox and there are but a scant few doses of vaccine available. In the event of an outbreak our ability to manufacture vaccine would be rapidly outpaced. If the wrong person got their hands on the Soviet smallpox by a weapon, billions could die. Nuclear weapons are bad enough, but they, at least, require a general war to break out in order to bring about an end to human civilization. A smallpox by a weapon doesn't require a war, just one security breach. 100% true as it happened to me, it's probably more spooky than scary, I'll let you be the judge. Many years ago, before there were cell phones we had these things called pages strapped to our hips. Someone would page you with their phone number and you would call them back. When you got to a phone, as an on-call technician working in the audiovisual field, my pager would go off all the freaking time. Like most people who use pagers, our clients knew that, if you followed up your number with a 911, that would indicate to the technician, to stop what they were doing, and call right away. Although I was always busy I really, if ever got 911s, one afternoon traveling from Orlando to St. Petersburg via Interstate 4, my pager goes off with a number one don't recognize, followed by the 911, I find the first exit, and pull into a little truck. Stop looking place outside of Plant City, to use the payphone. This takes maybe 3 minutes tops. I walk in, ask for some change and head to the wall where there are 4 payphones to choose from. I pop my quarter in, and dial the number displayed on my trusty pager. It rings, and rings, and rings, and rings. I'm thinking to myself WTF, who would page me with a 911, and not answer their phone. It's just about then that I notice another ringing sound in addition to the one in my ear. I pull the handset from my ear and two phones over on the wall another payphone is ringing. But with an incoming call, I hang up my the handset and the ringing stops on the other phone. I walk a few paces over, pick up the handset, and look at the phone number printed above the buttons. I look at the number on my pager. I look at the number on the phone. I look at the number on my pager again. I look at the phone again. Except for the 911 they are identical. I kinda lose my breath for a second. And then I make my way over to the girl at the counter. And ask if she saw anyone use the payphone. She said I was the only person in the store in the last hour. The whole episode probably took 15 minutes. But man. I was freaked out. The hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up. And I just wanted out of there. I get about 10 miles down the highway. And come upon a scene. That looked like a bomb went off for car pileup involving a tractor trailer hauling a load of steel that had come loose. State troopers and paramedics just arriving. I pulled over to the side and helped the best I could. But it was all pretty much over once it began. I have no idea why I got that page or from whom or what. But I'm convinced that if I hadn't, I would not be alive to write this today.